Good morning. Welcome today. This is uh, day nine of the uh, boat Dusseldorf 2023. And uh, it's been a very exciting week, very, very informational. Got a, a lot of uh, great speakers here on the stage the last few days. And if anybody missed anything, all of it is posted online. So if you want to see some of the talks that we had before, um, very, some very good speakers, some kind of heated discussions at times. So I, I recommend that you uh, have a look at that. It's, it's under the Blue Innovation Doc. Um, so uh, I'd like to welcome the audience and also all our online viewers, because it seems like we have more online viewers than we have audience. <laughs> And um, before we continue with this session, I think maybe a little bit closer. Yeah, so we can, yeah. Um, before we start, I just want to, first of all, thank uh, the tech team who have been really dedicated, been here every day this week. Well, thank God. <laughs> and helped with different uh, tech situations. Christian Polman and Jonas Fulke, thank you. And uh, I also want to thank Philip Easthill because he is actually the, the DJ of, of all the people that he found. I don't know how he found everybody, but uh, he must be very well connected and have a lot of friends. So thank you, Philip. Um, and then um, today our subject is going to be engaging citizens and boaters. So we're going to be talking with uh, boating associations, um, some people from boat itself, and uh, we're going to talk about how the industry should move forward with green solutions and green transition. And first we will have um, a talk by uh, Alexandra Rickman. She is head of sustainability at World Sailing, and she is also a double Paralympic medal medalist. So welcome, Alexandra. I'll just start. Yeah, okay, it's working. Um, hi, thank you so much for, for having me here. And it's amazing to see the absolute the size of this show because I guess everybody tells you how big Boot is, but until you see it in action, uh, you don't really quite understand. Um, but it's also amazing to see so many people coming out and supporting the boating industry, especially after the last couple of years. I think it's really encouraging for us uh, who work in the industry to see that people are re-engaging with boating, uh, re-engaging with sailing, which is obviously my sport, um, and hopefully we'll see more people out on the water getting involved in the sport. So I'm the head of sustainability for World Sailing. Uh, World Sailing is the governing body for the sport of sailing. So we look at all aspects of racing, everything from offshore racing through to dinghies and the Olympics is obviously seen as the pinnacle of what we uh, govern. World sailing has been seen as one of the leading, uh, and sailing itself has been seen as one of the leading sports uh, with regards to sustainability. And the reason for this is because of our direct relationship with nature is like what we're identifying as the key reason. We, as sailors and as boaters, uh, see the direct impacts that humans have on our planet, often in more tangible ways than in other sports. Um, when you can see the increase in waste, in plastics, in the oceans, when you can see that the water quality uh, can make you feel insufficient, know that we have insufficient sewage, infrastructure, when we see that storms and raising sea levels are actually part of our daily lives as sailing clubs and as boating clubs and marinas are having to see on a daily basis. And also that we're seeing storms with greater intensity and they're more common. And when at your local club and your local venue, people are consistently saying, the weather isn't normally like this then you rec recognize that actually our sport is on the forefront of climate change and we are seeing how nature is being affected by humans on a daily basis. So in response to this, World Sailing in 2018 was one of the first international federations to set out a sustainability strategy. 
This strategy is known as Agenda 2030 because it was looking towards the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and setting out how do we progress as a sport and our responsibilities to our members through to 2030. The reality is that we know that this is as long as a piece of string, as a never-ending piece of string, because we will be looking beyond 2030. But this is where we started from. Agenda 2030 aligns to the UN SDGs, as I alluded to, uh, to about 11 of those SDGs. We have direct uh, alignment. It is also aligns to the IOC's five sustainability pillars. The strategy is pretty comprehensive. <laughs> 56 deliverables across six operational areas. And that includes anything from how we operate our events, how we uh, work from the technical aspects, so looking at how we work with manufacturers and the building of boats, through to our membership, our venues, and our participation. The objectives cover both environmental and social aspects, uh, more so on the environmental end, but we definitely, as a sport, have had to work really hard on social, and we continue to, to become more of an inclusive sport. Um, but I want to set out a little bit and give you a bit of a snapshot into why this is relevant to the green transition and to the topic of today. So in Agenda 2030, basically we spend most of our time looking at how do we reduce? How do we reduce our negative impacts on the planet? How do we increase our positive impact? And I guess I can really bucket it into four distinct areas. We use regulations, we're using technology and innovation, we're using collaboration, and we're using education. Regulation within the agenda is both on the reduction of actual numbers and also in terms of our general impact. So when I talk about actual numbers, I'm talking about, and I was just talking before I came on stage uh, to somebody about it. When we host a regatta, at every Olympic classes regatta or any regatta, there are a number of coach boats out on the water. All of those coach boats are are, um, operate using fossil fuels. We have a number of support fleets. We have to have race committees. We have to have management boats. We have to have mark setting boats. All of these other boats, and as great as sailing looks, and, and the realities are when we look at it, we see it and we think, great, it's powered by the wind. But in the background, and if you look at any Olympic class regatta, you'll see tons, or if you look at the America's Cup, or you look at the ocean race, you see tons of boats which have combustion engines. This is intrinsically a massive problem. In Agenda 2030, we've committed to reducing coach boat numbers at our Olympic classes regattas by, at our world championships by 50% uh, based on our 2018 numbers. How are we going to do this? We're not exactly sure most of the time, but that could be that we put, you know, we get coaches to share boats. But we've created this performance culture, and now we need to be able to operate within it. We need to make amendments to it. We need to rethink the paradigm that we've already, that we previously created. The other requirement that we have on ourselves is how do we actually reduce our own organizational carbon footprint? This is, char this is difficult for us because in terms of our footprint, we need to reduce by 50% on our 2019 numbers. In terms of regulations, we have signed up to UN Sport for Climate Action Framework, which means that that 50% reduction needs to happen by 2030. But um, before that, we've, well, our reduction needs to happen. Our, our regulation sets out that it needs to, our reduction needs to happen by 2030. And alongside the UN, it's by 2050. That's no you know, small feat. That means that we have to figure out exactly how we can cut the impacts of our events by 50%. How do we as an organization, as a global organization, which has to 
increase participation across the planet, how do we stop flying people around the world? We're having to completely rethink exactly what we do. So one of the ways in which we do that is to commit to looking at new technologies and looking at innovation. We're engaging with the evolution of low carbon and zero carbon technologies, such as electric boats, robotic marks, hydrogen fleets. We're looking at all sorts of different opportunities to be able to reduce those impacts. The technology is developing quickly at the moment, but the realities are that we're where the car industry was six to 10 years ago. We need to speed up the transition, we need to adopt more, but we also need to work out how we're going to regulate the price point so that more events are able to access these technologies. It's really exciting at the moment because we are seeing a lot of movement in the marketplace. We're also seeing that our special events, so those big events like the Ocean Race, like Sail GP that you might have seen on TV, like the America's Cup, are engaging with the conversation intrinsically. They're also, they've signed up to our sustainability charter for special events, which puts requirements on them additionally. This is really exciting because they're pushing the boundaries. They're trying to advance the, the technology. They're both utilizing it on their race courses, testing it, being able to give feedback, but then they're also creating new technologies. With the advent of foiling, we've seen greater efficiency in the boats, but they're also moving faster. So we need to make sure that we are always complying with safety alongside this transition. Paris is gonna be the first Olympics where we intrinsically see a zero carbon fleet making, premiering on the support side of things. We were hoping that we'd see the migration into the coach boats already of, of lower carbon opportunities, but I think we're, that's a bit further down the path. Until the price point has gotten to a point where member national authorities are able to purchase easily or to access it, we need to come up ways to stimulate the market. So one of the things that World Sailing, what we've been working on is an effort called Challenge 2024, pushing towards Paris, looking at ways and means that we can stimulate the marketplace, you know, looking at opportunities where we may be able to create like a charter fleet that makes boats available so that the, the technology can be tested effectively and efficiently so that people can interact with it more and also so that we can work with marinas and the industry as a whole to put in the infrastructure because that's the key piece that everybody always forgets is that it's great having an electric boat but we need something to plug it into in the same way that we need the infrastructure for electric cars and vehicles on the roads. So as we progress that, we also need to make sure that that electricity we have to work our way down the chain. That electricity is coming from uh, renewable sources. We have to think about all of the steps along the journey in order to make sure that it is a truly a green transition and that we're not just doing it for lip service. We're not sport washing and we're not green washing along the way. The other aspect that we look at quite intensively is around the technical aspects of our sport. Our agenda is having us dig deeper into the often forgotten parts of the green transition, the materials that we use on a daily basis to build our boats. How do we set out uh, requirements for manufacturers to build with impact in mind from the start? How do we get them to think about what the end of a life of a boat is when they're building it, when they're designing it? The agenda requires boats selected for the Olympic Games in 2032 to be made up of a majority of recycled material. Again, this is, we don't really know the answer of how we're gonna get there in an effective way. 
We could make the changes tomorrow and put regulatory requirements on all of the manufacturers, but the reality is that we want to work with them. We need to have them as part of that conversation in order to drive forward. We need them to feed into the process. But in the meantime, we've developed two ways and we've had two approaches to the problem. One is that we have to choose more sustainable boat building materials and educate our manufacturers about the processes that are more efficient and that are, you know, are closer to the green transition. If you haven't had a chance to see them, uh, please do go and visit in Hull 16 Green Boats, who are the winners of the World Sailing Sustainability Award 2022. And they're advancing the use of sustainable materials in the boat building process. The second way that we're trying to come at this problem is to create a means of recycling and creating circularity of materials already in use. So the likes of carbon fiber, glass fiber, what do we do with them? For this, we are working with several other sports on a carbon fiber circularity project. That will also extend into other composites. With that, we're taking broken fi carbon fiber sports equipment, recycling the fibers with a to a level where the structural integrity is much higher than we've seen before. And then we're creating new sports equipment from it. That's the objective of the entire project. We're working alongside five other international federations and also manufacturing partners of each of those federations. So this last year, it was really exciting because Wilson Rackets, who came along as the partner for the International Tennis Federation, were able to take some of this carbon fiber material and build a racket out of 50%, using 50% of this recycled material. And they found that the racket seems to be performing at the same level that they'd wanted to. And obviously the long-term objective is that we get to 100%. And that means that sport, as the third largest user of carbon fiber, will actually be able to start to create a circular economy within itself. This also is one of the key examples of collaboration, which is one of the mechanisms that we're using heavily. Collaboration is ex essential in, co in transitioning to the green economy. Without co collaboration, we won't progress. The green transition in boating at all. Without buying from all of our stakeholders, our agenda in sailing, and that of the wider boating community will not succeed. In uh, working alongside the collaboration, we also recognize that we need to work with the likes of the community on other projects. So we work with uh, other institutions such as ICOMIA and other boating aspects of the boating industry to also come up with ways and means of educating our, in our, our industry and educating our stakeholders more thoroughly so they really understand what it means to transition in a green way. No, I'm so sorry. So I just want to say that um, hopefully you can use all of those tools to be able to progress forward. That's yeah, I just want to ask you, you mentioned 2052 for the 2000, materials. 2050. And who, uh, so who has put that number? Who was the one that put the 2050? Is it, did, did your organization do it or is it from the, the EU? So no, for the, for the materials, yeah. it's 2032, but that's because it's an Olympic year. So oh, okay. the next Olympic Games, so we always have to align our, how we're going to build and what boats we select for an Olympics. Okay, so that's the Olympic Committee who has set it to the... No, 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 that's within our agenda. With that's your own agenda. That, that's the goal okay. that we've set ourselves. Oh, good. So you're also internally... Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. All right, well, please remain on the stage because we want to talk to you some more in a minute. Um, and I would like to... Yes, thank you. So, one more question. When did you win those Olympic medals? What year was that? Um, London and Rio, so 2012 and 2016. Okay, yeah. wow, that is impressive. Thank you. Okay, so um, now I would like to uh, welcome our panelists to the stage, uh, including, of course, Alexandra. Uh, first, I want to welcome Robert Marks. 
He is managing director and president of Marx Technique, but he is also the president of the German Marine Federation, Dusseldorf Boat Show, and uh, European Confederation of Nautical Industries. So welcome. Thank you. And we're really going to give you a hard time. Pardon me? <laughs> we're going to give you a hard time. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have Dieter Handel. He is an expert in spatial planning, environmental and infrastructure affairs for the German Motor Yacht Association. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, finally, we have Mark Diening. He's CEO of Bavaria oh. Yachts. And he, in the past, he was also a consultant for Bombardier. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, help yourself. Do you want to come a little closer? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so today we're talking about engaging citizens and boaters. And I'm assuming there's a lot of boaters here in the audience. Um, Iris, can you hear me? <laughs> Maybe she can't hear me. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with you, Robert. Um, the question we have for you is, do you see a demand for more sustainable solutions from the customers of all your um, associations? And uh, maybe you can tell us a bit about the EcoShip 60. Yes. Um, after three years, first boat show here in Düsseldorf, um, we see a big demand for s sustainability. For our industry, it's uh, very easy because um, you only want to make water sport in clean water. So uh, our self-understanding is to, to, to reduce emission and to be more sustainability starting from, from the engine, where I'm responsible to, for, but also um, boat manufacturing and marinas and everything. So um, from that perspective, we hear what our customers say and we try to, to find a solution for that. And um, then I can answer what EcoShip 60 is. Um, when you look at the industry, they always have to find the right balance between legislation, sustainability, and the financial aspects. And um, with EcoShip 60, we have a cooperation of uh, SMEs and universities, and um, this is founded up to 60% by the German government. So when we take the three points, legislation um, and financial aspect, um, we can put the financial aspect a little bit in the back, and uh, we have the opportunity to research on new propulsion systems. So what you said, we, we have mainly combustion engines, and uh, if we see how old the combustion engines are we have in our industry, because the boats last so long, we have to find a solution for the existing engines, e-fuels for example, and uh, we have a great opportunity to manufacture e-fuels if we see the running hours of an average boat that is 50 hours a year compared to a car that is 5,000 hours a year, it's quite easy to switch from, from uh, normal fuel to e-fuel without expanding dramatic uh, the demand. So with EcoShip 60, um, technically we are, we are looking on fuel cell systems for boats up to 60 meters. Um, what is uh, very demanding, very demanding research, but we are quite far and uh, we are expecting later this year after the summer to have the first prototype for a boat with uh, 16 meters, with a fuel cell, with e-fuel driven generators and completely electric driven. So we we've, um, feed the electric motors by fuel cell and by, by e-fuel driven generators. Mm -hmm. And, and a fuel cell, what, I, I don't, what is that exactly? The um, it's, uh, it's very technical, but um, to make it simple, out of uh, hydrogen or methanol, both you can make uh, with green energy, um, you can produce um, electric power. So your idea would be to have both of those uh, engines in the boat? Yes. So you could choose depending on how far yeah, it's, you have it's, to go? It's automatically done by, by um, your demand, what you're doing. Okay, so, um, so the EcoShip uh, 60 
is is an actual boat that has those. It's things. a corporation. No, it's a it's a corporation. Yeah. And um, with universities and SMEs. But can we see the boat? Yes, um, okay. not yet, but uh, later this year. So it is an existing boat, but we put all the technology in. In it, yeah. And okay. um, the difference to, to what we do in our daily business where we develop product, it's research. So it goes much deeper. Yeah. So, um, and that's why the universities help. Okay, good. Yeah, so, so um, that was a discussion that we had earlier um, that, uh, that Germany especially as a country does not get a lot of the subsidies for these types of research because it kind of all goes to the car industry because the art car industry is big and um, there doesn't seem a, to be a body here that's actually going after those subsidies even though you have all these universities that could help so yeah that could yeah. be something yeah it's 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 the challenge is to 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 find where the money is and um, the bigger companies have people in Brussels or, or in Berlin just looking for, for funds yeah. and um, that's impossible for, for um, SMEs. Okay, so who would be able to do that? You have to make it as a corporation, so that's okay. why we founded the umbrella Ecoship 60 okay. and um, there are several guys taking care of the projects but also of the money okay. and um, they know where the fundings are for research or developments and uh, that's why we founded that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. So Dieter, um, so it's kind of a similar question to you because of your position. Uh, so what can the boating, boating industry, marinas, legislation do to be cleaner? And do you see, since you're so in contact with all the members, do you see them also seeing the importance? It's a broad question. Yeah. And I will start with the last part of that question. I uh, represent uh, the club boating in European level in European Boating Association for 16 years. And I have learned that it is not easy to reach a common position from all that different types of boating in for all different nations. So we reached in European Boating Association, EBA, it's parallel to EBI, a compromise a position paper last October on a very high but uh, not concrete and, and uh, level. So I have the idea that it is important that we have to try to change our mind and try to reach the members and that is what our German Motor Yacht Association tries to reach. We formed two years before a specialized group, group to think about one of that point, key point uh, uh, transition of um, uh, propulsion of boats and we try to find solutions and found them and that are different uh, uh, solutions, different from smaller boats, for smaller boats used uh, only uh, by um, carrying by trailers to a lake and loaded in a garage, from touring boats on great tours with long uh, distances and uh, great power to push that boat against the stream of a river like the Rhine. And the solutions reach from electricity to e-fuel and hopefully if the industry will be successful, develop new uh, technologies, we will find more suitable technologies for the different types of boatings. We try to reach our members, 100,000 members in Germany, by uh, workshops, by uh, uh, seminars, to inform them what is on the market, to bring them to them information. And last year we started with two su such seminars. They will f uh, follow four seminars in the in this year, and we 
are in touch. What are those? What are those seminars called? You said transition for, for uh, uh, propulsion of of okay. not just there is several several uh, okay. several seminars, but the, the key point of today is transition of propulsion. In the years before, we have had uh, some uh, key points, uh, anti-fouling or uh, other points. Um, end of life of boats isn't a key point for Germany that is special. But uh, now we have the key point, uh, transition of propulsion. And we have one boater who has a boat with two engines and two tanks, and he has is already testing both fuels financed by our organization, uh, ordinary diesel, and uh, it will be a HVO, uh, that is a special form of, of green uh, uh, e-fuel, uh, by waste of, of bi biological waste uh, uh, produced already in sufficient uh, uh, amounts that we can buy it uh, next week there will be open uh, filling station, especially for boaters, and at the Weser River. Where where will that be? Where will that be? The um in, in in Hoya at the Weser River there will be the first uh, filling station for I e call it a fuel. E it will be HVO because it is uh, uh, produced on the base of of biological waste, but it is cleaner than than diesel. It's not as efficiency, maybe 95%, but we will test it. But the most important uh, 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 result is that we can use it in our ordinary machines, on, uh, only uh, fill it um, and use it without <coughs> any change in the machine, on the engine, or uh, we can use the ordinary filling stations we can use the existing uh, infrastructure. Yeah. So and that is important because we have to consider that our boats will be used until 2070, 2080. Yeah. But so what you're saying, if I have a 20-year-old boat yes. with a diesel engine, I can just put the e-fuel in and it won't damage the boat. It'll, it'll be the same. Exactly. It just might be... You exactly. might have to refill it a little yeah. more often, but it won't um, make the boat go slower or damage the engine. We will test it. Yeah, you're we testing it now, we right? Are, we are now testing. And can we uh, somewhere find the testing results online, or is it still is it so new? It, it, it they don't exist today. Okay. <laughs> we are still in the in the testing phase. Yeah, yeah. And we need a, ne a next session. Yeah. Of boating, and that will start in April. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh. <laughs> so that's. It sounds very hopeful because if there's not a huge investment for in infrastructure, if it's just a question of making the e-fuel available, it seems like a a very good short-term um, solution. Uh, so, Mark, for you, I would like to ask, uh, what um, are your experiences with your previous um, experience in, in different industries uh, um, for seeing the future customer, what their interest is in sustainability? Yeah. I think we are in a very, very fortunate situation because um, all the questions around awareness is where we need we are not having this kind of discussions. Um, I always compare it, if you look into the city, streets are not always as clean. If you look into your own living room, it's clean. So boaters, sailors, they love and consider the water, the ocean, like their living room. So they have an intrinsic motivation to keep it clean, to embark on the transition. And uh, it happened in other industries over the last decade. So we don't need to convince. Uh, people are fully aware there is a pull. And the question is, how fast can we deliver uh, change? And uh, therefore, I think we're in a, in a lucky situation. Um, we have good support. We just need to see, as we mentioned, our products, they're living 30, 40, 50 years. There's technology, there are different use cases. So we don't have the answer for all cases already today. 
if you see the car industry and the truck industry. The car industry started with electrical, um, but not the trucks. And then the question was, why don't we do it on trucks? Because it's different technology needed, it's a different use case. The same in our industry, if you're cruising on a lake, which has maybe 30 nautical miles, two miles to shore, it's much easier to build the infrastructure. Um, also, when you look to range, which you can provide today, uh, so these kind of boats will be the first ones. If you look into uh, Bavaria with a yacht business, I mean, once you're on three meter waves, engine not working, no petrol anymore, it's a very uncomfortable situation. Yeah? So in this kind of product segment, it will take longer. Uh, the technology still need to advance. Uh, but I think overall, the customers are asking for it. We will provide um, answers more in the lake or coastal area first, um, and then it will, will evolve together with technology. And, and to what size uh, ship are you building as a, as a, as a boat builder? Yeah, so we are in the uh, segment 30 to 60 feet, okay. um, so some coastal, um, but um, also some real blue water sailing. Okay. Um, and you can see also on the, the boat, most of the electrical solutions yet are below 10 meters, uh, more focusing, but that doesn't mean that you don't need to do something. So we are preparing together with the uh, propulsion manufacturers um, and then we will f show the solutions in the next two, three years uh, across our portfolio. So, so you're giving us the inside information. You're, is there something new coming yeah. from Bavaria Yachts that... Yeah, I mean, I we think uh, to? it's not really a, a secret, uh, but it's also not the stage for a big innovation announcement. Uh, but you see that in the industry, we are reaching uh, the segment uh, across 10 meters. Uh, you see that we look into alternative ways, uh, materials to use. You were talking about recycling. Um, of course, there are questions to be answered, but this will come um, step by step. Uh, we talked about hybrid solutions. Um, it's too early for a series manufacturer yet uh, to offer that because um, it's not that you only have your boat normally within 10 kilometers. Um, our boats go across countries, the infrastructure is needed. So there are a few things which we need to do in parallel to make sure that the customers are really accepting uh, the new technologies. And, and just out of uh, curiosity, even if your customer would not be asking for this, would you as a manufacturer already start doing it? Or do you really wait for the customer to ask you? No, I mean, we have an intrinsic motivation. Okay. So, um, first of all, we are all humans, uh, individuals with our own motivation. Uh, since uh, the end of the 70s, uh, we are in the industry and we have a lot of sailors, boaters uh, of between our employees. So, of course, we know what's happening. We push for it. Uh, we have the same push from inside the company, which we have from our customers. Okay, thank you. Sounds Sounds hopeful. <laughs> I think you guys are the first panelists that get uh, applause <laughs> during. <Thank you. laughs> Usually it's afterwards. Okay, uh, so Alexandra, you also, you've already told us quite a bit, but um, I just wanted to ask you, um, so I guess uh, in, in, the, um, in the world sailing, uh, they're, also, they're already doing some tests and some trials on becoming uh, for sustainable solutions. Um, as, is there things you could share with maybe the, the you know, not the racing industry? Would, you be, uh, would your organization be open to share those technologies? Oh, no, of course. I mean, I think I everything... Think you say no. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> no. no to collaboration. No. <laughs> no, we're all about collaborating and figuring out new ways, you know. So we're always looking also to other industries to see what's happening. And also, you know, and if, if there's an opportunity for us to do something alongside them or to learn from another industry, um, you know, it would be stupid for us to, to not try and embrace uh, anything that's going on in the space and you know and learn and i think you know to, to what you're saying is that is the different spheres in which we operate mean that we have to look across the gamut you know we have to care about the lakes we have to care about rivers we have to care about the oceans and the coasts because they're all very different environments to operate within and so we're always searching for you know for the technologies to be able to help deliver and is there something you could say right now well this is what we've discovered that should be implemented in the more leisure sector? Is there something that, that you've come across that maybe is not common yet? Or 
like a technology or um no not real i wouldn't say there's anything uh you know i think the progression of uh of electric boats is obviously we're getting for the greater range and so that's really exciting i think also um you know the america's cup is focusing really heavily on hydrogen as an option and that's obviously very exciting for us in terms of the next steps because i think particularly for the coasts and for like for wider range um, offshore, uh, hydrogen may become the, the fuel of choice, uh, which is also, you know, predominantly the fuel for shipping and for lots of other industries at the moment, which that they're investigating. If I may add, add one yeah. point for uh, the industry, sport competition is always the possibility to show what they have in the back because it's not money driven, it's not commercial driven but um, you can show what is possible and uh, if you look at America's Cup, nobody's turning the dollar around before investing it. Um, it's just about um, the possibilities, speed, and um, that's a very good opportunity for the users at the end of the day because many innovations, when you look at motor racing, car racing, uh, many innovations are coming from sports and then implemented into the normal life. Yeah, so we are, we are glad to have you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, and we're open to being the, the, you know, the crash test dummies, I guess, is, is the only way to put it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I saw the, the results of the, um, the study that was done uh, at the beginning of this show, and it said that uh, consumers value sustainability, but um, they still have a higher value for price, comfort, design, and range. So that I want to go back to Bavaria Yachts to mm -hmm. when you hear that, what, what, what are you thinking or what would you advise your customer? No, I think it's a very fair point. I mean, I'm looking a little bit more from the, from the safety usability aspect. Um, if you have a boat which you could use for 200 nautical miles before and now you have 25, it's a different experience, it's a different use case. So we need to find technology answers. Um, also, when it comes to price points, you saw it in the electrical car industry, um, it's a challenge. Uh, if the prices are too high, some people cannot afford. Yeah? So it's our responsibility to make sure that we drive the technology in a way uh, that we get the volume, that we get the cost down, that we get new innovation. This is taking time. You will always have early adopters, and we rely also in our industry on the early adopters who are willing to take the risk, who are taking the higher price, accepting the lower usability, maybe, uh, in the first case. Um, but we need these customers um, to give us the momentum and the volume uh, to build um, the series for the future. So I think it's a natural behavior. Um, but my perception is that people are willing uh, to pay more. Yeah? It's That's not unlimited. Yeah? Uh, they're also willing to accept some inconvenience. But again, it's not unlimited. So uh, we need to move a sweet spot year after year. Uh, to get a broader audience um, onto the boat. Because I said, the intrinsic motivation, I didn't hear anyone who doesn't care. Yeah. Um, there's not a lot of lip service in our industry uh, because there's a genuine interest of the customers. So I think we have, a, as I said in the beginning, we have a very good environment. Um, it's just a matter how fast are we in the race uh, to bring technology um, and to bring also the cost and the use cases uh, to a sweet spot. Did you want to add something, Dieter? <sighs> There's a big problem for boat tourism because, as we stated, uh, the, long li uh, the long, long living boats causes that um, for a long time boaters will use uh, alternative fuels and there is no uh, economic interest in building charging stations for electricity. So, uh, in the nice areas and um, natu natural protected areas of the rivers, it is impossible to build a net like we have it for cars in the towns. That means one main target of the European Boating indus Industry, uh, uh, Boating Association, uh, to have a borderless uh, boating tourism without restrictions is impossible. If there is an, a UK boater who wants to come, come 
and sail the Rhine, he will not find for years loading stations. There is no loading station interest for the commercial shipping and our inland boaters don't need them because they have, must travel the Rhine with fuel and cannot achieve it electric. And the same on the Danube, the Rhone and other rivers. So we wouldn't find a net of loading stations. Uh, but the European Commission is dreaming of this. We heard it on, on, on Tuesday that they are working for a regulation for loading station net for inland waterways. So then that I wanted will, to... will be a problem, yeah. a big problem. Do, do, do you um, have any ideas about this or are, are you, can you also advise to say maybe we don't now make charging stations for boats that don't exist yet? Or, um yeah, advising is always nice, but um, if we compare our industry to the automotive industry, electric cars are highly subsidized by, by the governments. So um, yeah. I think we would have only very few electric cars if we haven't had um, um, these subsidizers. The yeah. And also the same for the, for the charging stations. When we talk about inland waterways where um, electric boating or electric propulsion is a, is a nice solution, um, we, we, it has to be driven by the politicians, by the politics. And uh, we were very happy to, to have commissioners from Brussels here at the, at the Boot Düsseldorf, and we discussed that. They are open, um, they, they know the intrinsic uh, demand of the users to have uh, sustainable water sports, but um, at least when you talk about money, um, people uh, sometimes stop thinking. But uh, we push them very hard to, to, to support us to, to make the charging network and um, also to, to give us the possibility to develop or to research in, in new solutions. And what we also find out that um, for water sports, the responsible politicians for water sport are not as dogmatic um, for electric propulsion as we have in the automotive industry. They are open to other solutions. So good, yeah. with, with our research project, what you mentioned, EcoShip Eco 60 with the uh, fuel cells, um, it's, it goes in a different direction that the main direction is in the automotive industry. And um, I'm sure that um, the intrinsic motivation, but also the support of the politicians and the industry will help us very soon to reach the goal to reduce uh, the CO2 footprint by 50% in the next years. Okay. And Alexandra, how realistic do you think it is to, <laughs> to do this? Oh, what, uh, you mean to, what, to, to strive for 50%? For yeah. um, no, I think it is realistic because I think we, need to, we have to have push goals. And the reality is that we just need to rethink how we do things. You know, um, what I was trying to allude to when I was speaking before was just that, you know, we, we've set the criteria of how we operate. We've, you know, we've set our economic systems the way we have, you know, and so within sport, we've set performance as, as the number one. But actually, it's just that we need to rethink that performance and, and the way in which we get there. So I think... I think it is feasible. I just think that we are going to need help. We are going to need support from the governments. We're going to need the regulatory systems to, to help. And also, we, we need to get better at collaborating you know, across industries to be able to help solve the problems. I mean, especially when you talk about taking up sp or picking up speed, uh, Robert was mentioning before, um, to be less uh, dogmatic. Um, it's always faster to change your behavior than the technology. Yeah? So just to give you one example, um, where a lot of fuels burn for generators to produce electricity. Of course, it would be good to have no generator. It would take more time. Yeah? Of course, it would be nice to have e-fuels in the generator. It will also take time. Yeah? But to adapt your pattern, put some solar panels uh, onto the boat, uh, think about the consumption on the boat, that is something which you can do within the next 12 months. So I think it's the whole package of applying what we already have, having the right mindset, making small little steps, um, and then by the time already improving uh, to get the technology ready, uh, then I think a lot is possible within a decade. A lot is possible. Is there, is there a, a stand on the boat show that has, that's 
that has solar panels for boats? Is there somebody here? Yes, uh, it's everywhere. Um, okay. I think that's a trend um, already more or less for five years. Uh, we offer it uh, as a serious manufacturer, as a kind of initial. Um, and then there are a lot of companies around with mobile solutions. Um, so yes, if you want, you can already do it today. And you can do it on an older boat because that, I mean, that it's on a new boat is, is logical. But if you want, if you have a boat that you've loved for the last 30 years and you don't want to change it, yeah. but what are your options then? Uh, very easy. Um, nowadays, with a new battery technology, solar panel, uh, there's still an investment needed. So depending on your boat, you will need to invest a few thousand um, to make it work. But you also get the reward of no generator noise. So it's not only doing the right thing, a good conscious, um, it's also a better experience on the water. And I, I truly believe in this mix of, uh, of benefits together with the right motivation. You can start today. On solar panels, you don't need to wait. Yeah, so then I, I wanted to come back to you. Um, so uh, how willing do you think people will be to like either retrofit or, um, or change or, or accept the eco-fuel? Our feeling is that we have a much higher acceptance on, on boats than, for example, on, on cars or so, because it's their hobby. And uh, so, um, from that perspective, I don't see any problem to, if we offer the right solution, um, if it's feasible, if it's, if it's, if it's practical, um, the, people, the people accept it. And would there be uh, like an incentive, since you spoke to some uh, politicians from Brussels, would they do an incentive to help boaters become like subsidies or, or uh, tax cuts, if you would... Not yet. Not yet. But Not is yet. that in the pipeline that you we know We are of? working on that. We are working on that. But, um, you know, they also can spend the euro only once. So um, we are not the first line. Okay. Mm. So that is, a, that is a thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any uh, final comments or...? Yes. Um, I expect that our voters will we accept changing to ecofuel but there is no or low interest to change the engine to change what what was the, the last thing so to change the engine the engine okay they don't want to change the engine but they would change the fuel yeah that is if it was what, available what all our members uh, of course discuss with us so we will have a good progress in reaching the 50% uh, goal in, in 2030, but only with ecofuel and not with electric drive. So we have only a rate of 2% new boats in our boating uh, family. Uh, electric? Elect no, no, new boats. Oh, okay. well, the boat, the longevity of 50 years means that only 2% of the boat, uh, existing boats were renewed. Uh, yearly. Okay, and then I just want to finish with Alexandra. What do you think about the eco fuel, or are you more? Let's go even further and do the hydrogen, or what is your uh, like? Maybe this is short term and long term. Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a it's a decent um, short term uh, option. You know, for events, for example, for sailing events, we've been using HVO and generators, and you know to be able to drive down our carbon footprint. So, um, and also they'll end up getting used in some of, some of the boats on the water, some of the support fleet boats. And there are e-fuels being used in support fleets currently. Um, I, but I do think that we, we need to, s to stretch further. Uh, we're also seeing that, you know, um, that our, our people are open to it. You know, they're not, they, they want to protect the oceans. They want to protect our environment. So, they're happy to actually make the changes, and it's just more about how much more can they do? What are the stretch goals within that? So an example is offshore boats. We put in a requirement that should come into effect at some point, hopefully soon, which would be 20% uh, renewable energy on board. You know, and that's what we want for, for ocean racing. But actually, some of the feedback we're getting is we could go we can do more than that we can do more than that right now like you know just with solar panels so actually we're we're having it coming at us the opposite way you know actually push us harder and that's exciting to know that the community is behind it and that they want to 
to get us, you know, us moving faster. Okay. All right. Well, I think uh, I'm going to finish off there. And uh, I think this was a really good, good talk. And I think also quite informational for the audience. And uh, I'm glad to hear from you that, uh, that there are things also happening on, uh, on, a gov on a EU level. So thank you to our panelists. And um, you. if you have any, if any burning questions for the panelists, please talk to them uh, afterwards. All right. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. <laughs>